watching this shit! It's time for history! Hello, boys and girls, and people in between, and or neither. My name is Laser Pig, twice voted YouTube's sexiest pig. Do not fact check this. Anyway, in the last episode that I did some time ago, where I ranted on tanks for an unspecified period of time, we learned about tanks. What tanks are tanks, what tanks are not tanks, that I can't spell, that I don't know how end screens work, and that also that there are a lot of people online who don't know half of what they think they do. For more information, see this video. Anyway, World War One. So that guy shoots this guy with a gun, and so begins a long depressing explanation of early 20th century European politics, ending in a war where almost as many people die from the fighting conditions as to gunfire. But that is horrifyingly depressing to talk about, and this video is about tanks, and tanks are exciting. So we're going to talk about tanks. If you want to experience the true horrors of the First World War, strap a lot of paint cans to your back, dig a hole in your backyard, and sit in the rain for four years. Or watch They Shall Not Grow Old by Peter Jackson, a film which absolutely does not sponsor this video in any way, shape, or form, but is a highly recommended amazing documentary using full HD level restored footage, which you can now buy on YouTube, or Amazon, or watch for free on iPlayer, assuming you live in Blighty and have paid your tele license which I'm legally required to say and encourage you not to use some other method of watching it for free or not paying your non-legally enforceable TV license, which no one pays anyway because the BBC turned out to be harboring more paedophiles in the Catholic Church. Anyway, tanks. So, the British Mark I tank rolls off the production line and it's covered in a tarp and flown out to the front lines just in time for the Battle of the Somme. The most famous bloodiest and most depressing battle of the war. So for context, the Battle of the Somme is this, the British have this fantastic, brilliant new idea. What they're going to do is they're going to get all of their artillery and just for about a week, just shell the German line, just fire everything they've got, all the artillery at this one very specific spot for over a week. And they tell the troops that they're going to absolutely devastate everything so badly that they can just get out of the trench and saunter casually across no man's land towards the German lines. There, there won't be any of them left. They'll all be dead. So that doesn't quite work out according to plan. Um, about a million people die. Scotland itself loses about a fifth of its army and the river Somme runs red with all the blood that's in it. Welcome to my comedy video. <laughs> let's let, let's just stick to tanks, okay? I mean, because the tanks that were deployed here were, okay, you know what? Let me put you in the position of a German field trip. You've been under attack by artillery for, for weeks. You haven't seen the sunlight in forever. You've been drinking schnapps because there's no water, very little food, and almost nowhere dry. You've had no access to your terabyte of tentacle porn back home, and it has been years since you've seen a single anime titty. No, you can't bring the anime tits into the trench with you. No, fuck. But then the bombardment stops and you emerge, drunkenly hung over from your shelter, crawling on your hands and knees as the sunlight hits your eyes for the first time in a week, and your brain immediately starts screaming because, I mean, if you are lucky enough to still be in your early 20s and, or haven't gotten drunk, then you won't know this, but once you get past the age of 25 and you get drunk one night and the sunlight hits your eyes, it feels like death! Death has come! Ah! This is life in your 30s. This is what you young fucks have to look forward to. Sometimes I get the hangover while I'm still drunk. 
I'm at the party on my third bottle of vodka, feeling only a little tipsy, but forgetting that this is just my brain luring me into a false sense of security. And just as someone is giving me eyes from across the room, and the slow dance music starts, the demons come out, and they claw at you! You have fallen for their trap, and this would lead only to your drunken demise. You are now rolling on the floor in pain and agony, drooling and shivering, realizing that this was a horrible mistake, and you just want to be home with your blanket and your video games. Welcome to your thirties, bitch. It's all downhill from here. Anyway, back to war. You emerge from your bunker, etc., etc., so on and so forth, and for the first ten minutes, nothing happens. There's an eerie stillness to the world. And then, through the mist, you hear the grunts and moans of a six-cylinder diesel bus engine as towards you, rattling and clanking, comes the most ridiculous thing you have ever seen in your life. And then it starts shooting at you. Historians have a divided opinion on what the Germans were feeling at this moment. Some historians, mainly British ones, describe the Germans as fleeing in terror, while other historians, German ones, describe them as having an attitude of almost perplexment as to what the fuck is this? What, what, what is this going on? I don't know. Hans, do you know what's going on? I don't know what's going on. We're weeks in that bunker. We emerged and there were boxes moving towards us. This is exciting. But regardless if it was fear or perplexment, they eventually realized that tanks are big and slow and very stupid and can be very easily taken out by an artillery shot. And the Germans have a lot of those. And if one gets stuck, the British will fire their artillery at it because they don't want these things being captured by the Germans. So being a tanker in those early days, pretty shit affair. Not only is every artillery piece on the German line now firing at you, your own artillery is aiming at you and will shoot you if you fail, and you have to wear this dumb mask to stop bits of hot metal sticking into your face. Oh, and the tank keeps breaking down. Oh, and your only line of communication with the outside world is a bird. This bird. Pigeon. Now, yes, wireless communication was a thing back then, and ciphers for that kind of system were incredibly advanced. I mean, they even had their own systems that could detect if they were being intercepted, and there's this whole submarine cyber war between Britain and France as they try to tap into each other's undersea telegraph cables. I'll do a video on that someday, probably, because nobody believes me that that actually happened, but <laughs> it did, trust me. Anyway. Now, that is not to say that no tank had wireless communications. They did. Here's the problem. I, I described the hellscape of No Man's Land to you. It's, it's a mud that's like glue, and there's bits of building and bodies and metal and razor wire everywhere. It's, it's, it's a horrible nightmare land, and getting a signal through that on a 1910s radio set, not an easy task. It takes a bit of effort, so the pigeon's a bit more reliable. The UK had about 150 Mark 1s, but they did not have enough guns for them all, the big six-pounder cannons. So it was decided just to take half the tanks and fit just machine guns to them, therefore separating them into the male and female tank class accordingly. Male tanks with a big cannon, cause you know, big gun for a big man. <laughs> and machine guns for the female, because as we all know, under the skirt of every woman are two three and a half inch Hotchkiss machine guns, ready to unleash a molten steam of hot lead to spray down their enemies. I'm assuming, I'm gay, I've never seen a vagina. I believe they look like this. There were also tanks that had a cannon on one side and machine guns on the other, and they were known as hermaphrodites. Now, some female tanks were ranked into specialities, some of those being wireless communication. It was their job to report back to HQ what was going on. But to do that, the tank has to stop completely and erect a giant scaffold, which is not particularly practical when you're being shot at. So the tank's initial deployment is not exactly the great success everyone hoped it was. There were some local successes in the Somme and a little few tactical gains are made at a huge cost of life. Uh, Field Marshal Haig becomes known for his tactic of throwing wave after wave, wave of his own men weapon. at the enemy, the ideology that will personify the First World War, and he will go down in history by his nickname, the Butcher of the Somme. 
Now, tanks are regarded by some to be a bit of a lame duck, a, an expensive flop, but they're not done yet. You see, the army starts to see the potential of them and considers their failures to being having deployed in too few a number, so they demand better tanks and more of them. Now, when people think of First World War British tanks, the one they will likely picture is the Mark IV, which was the most common. Mark IIs, Mark Threes, very visually similar to Mark Ones, as they only incorporated a small number of improvements that were mostly kept for training purposes. A few Mark IIs were sent to the front, they were used in a RAS, but by this time the Germans had developed armour-piercing rounds, and the tanks became death traps. The Mark III has incorporated many improvements over the Mark I's and were the first to be fitted with the Lewis gun. This was a totally new concept for a machine gun, a light machine gun, originally developed in America, but the Americans weren't interested in, in what the hell is this, your, I don't, I don't, your light machine gun, I don't want your goddamn commie light gun, I want my big beefy American made manly gun, get the hell off my property boy. So the British purchased it and finished the design themselves. It's got a drum on top and it makes this kind of weird bone rattling sound when it fires. Rattle them boys. <laughs> So it was built for mobile warfare, which may surprise a lot of people that such a thing was a concept in World War I. I've, I've gone on about that, don't worry about it. But just to put it in brief, a typical machine gun of World War I weighs about £100. That is on the lightest skill. Bigger German ones could be about twice that. Lewis gun, £28. Hence, light machine gun. You can also carry it by yourself and fire it without ripping your arms off. So, good thing. Anyway. Tank Mark IV hits the shelf and shoppers are going mad for them. After this, the remaining Mark I's get regulated to ammunition carriers or secondary duties like this one acting as a mobile airship tether for some reason. Uh, some other Mark I's get converted into these gun carriages or SPGs, that's uh, self-propelled guns as we know them today, which is the oddly novel idea of moving the artillery with the infantry so they don't do something stupid like wander out of range. It also means you could have all the gun crew and the ammunition come with you, which saved the lives of a lot of young boys in the war who typically died trying to bring large amounts of ammunition to the front for the artillery guns. Because if you're a sniper and you see someone carrying a very large, heavy explosive, what are you going to do? Sorry, I know, depressing. You know, eh, let's stick to the exciting stuff, I'm sorry. Okay, here's ammunition being carried to the front by a train, as well as troops. Just look at the sheer look of terror on that man's face. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, what was I saying? Come on, quickly, quickly, I can't remember. I get tanks, right, okay. So the Mark IV is more heavily armored, utterly nullifying German armor-piercing ammunition. Yeah, Viraboos, not everything Germany makes is awesome and war-winning. Hear me say this a lot, I mean, Mark IV also shortens the barrels of the main six-pounder gun so they can fit into things like streets and the doors of the factory they were made in. Mark IVs were more common and you'll see examples and pictures of them everywhere in museums. Uh, they're most famous for being involved in the world's first tank versus tank battle, which was at the second battle of those Bretagnol. Bretagnol? Bre I need to do my French section. Villers Bretagnol. Yeah, that'll do. And now I'm going to play some footage from a documentary which shows a recreation of this famous tank battle. A lot of money went into the production of its graphics, and I think you'll agree with me in saying how incredible and lifelike they are. On the early morning of the 24th of April, Ludendorff's forward units were less than 10 miles from Amiens, probing towards the village of Villiers Bretonneux. One and a half miles southwest of the village, a section of British tanks, one male and two females, was waiting in support of dug-in infantry. So this takes place during the famous 40-mile push by the Germans that puts them in sight of Paris. It was one of the very few times that a German tank was operational, in this case an, an A7V, which I'll maybe talk about in a different video. It, it trundles out of the fog towards a position where three British tanks are sitting, somewhat perplexed or perhaps terrified, depending on your nationality, of what it was they were looking at. Only one of the British tanks had big guns, so it fired first. The German tank couldn't see anything, you just heard explosions going off around them, so it stops and after scooting around a bit, it manages to fire off a bunch of rounds at the two supporting British tanks. Well, the, the main British tank, the male, tries to get in a bit closer. The two spot each other, shoot at each other for a bit, and then the German tank retreats. And that's about as exciting as it gets. 
The Mark IV was also used in the Battle of Cambria, which is the first major battle where tanks were deployed en masse. Finally. It was also one of the first battles to use combined arms warfare, something frequently mislabeled as Blitzkrieg by people who should know better, and credited to the Germans 30 years later. So people are often surprised to know, yes, it was a thing in World War I. I will make a video on that. I mean, I mean, I keep saying I'll make a video on this, I'll make a video on that. But I promise on that one, because it's a little important, and everyone enjoys kicking Marabou ass. Because, let's face it, they're an easy target. Cambria was a success, uh, though the part the tank played has been somewhat overvalued by historians, like me. It did trigger the idea that the use of tanks, provided their teething issues could be resolved, was a worthwhile idea. So then, two very important things happen. Firstly, the Germans start developing better anti-tank weapons, leading to the Mauser tank... Gurer... That thing, which is the first true anti-tank rifle. They also had some other anti-tank weapons around at the time, most notoriously the K-Bullet mentioned earlier, which was a high-velocity armor-piercing bullet that could be fired from a standard rifle and was typically issued to snipers who hated it because it had a tendency to explode in the rifle, which was a bit of a problem if you were the guy holding the rifle at the time. And I do have something that needs clarifying here. Earlier, I mentioned the Germans were using some sort of armor-piercing rounds, and a lot of people, thanks to Wikipedia, seem to be under the belief that this was machine gun bullets. This is because, if you'll pardon the deviation while I talk about pew-pew shells for a moment, the German 13.2mm Tough is often confused for the 50 cal BMG round, which was under development at the same time and was partially influenced by the German design. They are, however, utterly different bullets. There is no evidence to suggest the Germans ever fired the 13.2mm from machine guns. That bullet was only ever used in anti-tank rifles, which were one-shot bolties. Hi, it's post-production Laser Pig here. Look, that last thing I said is going to get a lot of people riled up in the comments, so uh, let me just clarify my clarification over the, uh, the tunes of my very squeaky chair here. Uh, so the Germans did build a machine gun that was capable of chambering the 13.2mm anti-tank round. It was called the MG-18 Tank und Fliege. However, it was produced in very limited numbers, never saw frontline combat, never saw action. Yeah. The idea potentially comes from the Second World War, where Panzer 1s and 2s fired modified K-bullets from their turret-mounted machine guns. So anyway, back to tanks. So the Mark V now comes along, and this was supposed to be a total redesign of the tank, incorporating a number of new systems, but Mark IVs suck and we need a million new tanks by Christmas, so scrap that, get an old tank and just make it better. That became the Mark V, and this is where British tanks sort of peak during World War I. Yeah? The Mark V is more famed for its use after World War I. Uh, numerous Mark Vs were used in the Allied intervention of the Russian Civil War. Uh, a lot were captured and retained by the various countries, and most still have them in various conditions. And in World War II, one was stolen by the Home Guard, brought back into working order, and was used to defend the British coast against invasion. If or not it did anything other than ferrying troops to the pub and back is unknown, but I suspect its use against modern armour of that period, even if it is the very shitty early German tanks, would have been like trying to stop a modern tank with rude gestures. I mean, you'll hurt the driver's feelings, but he's not going to stop. Two Mark V's, or possibly Mark IVs, were also found after the Battle of Berlin by the Russians, apparently having been reactivated and stolen from a museum. This was actually very common in the Battle of Berlin. A lot of museum pieces were reactivated and uh, thrown against the Russians. I've seen pictures of German soldiers with uh, old First World War rifles, I've seen them with black powder rifles, crossbows, you name it. The Mark V was also key to kickstarting the tank development program of several other countries most notably America, who would go on to develop several of their own versions, and then claim they invented it. So Britain would make a number of other tanks, of which only maybe three would really leave the prototype stage, and I'll talk about those maybe some other time, because honestly they're not particularly worth mentioning, unless it's this one, which is the flying elephant, which can't fly, nor is an elephant, but it is kind of like the first kind of idea of building like a super heavy tank, so it's, it's kind of interesting in that regard, but yeah. Hi, post-production laser pig here again. Yes, I'm aware of the K-Wagon. Again, never built. Shut up. The only other tank Britain would produce in significant numbers was the Whippet, which was an idea for a tank, but a bit lighter. 
so it could move a bit faster than the heavier, slower models. It didn't really see much action until 1918, and it had a very significant problem, and that problem was that the exhaust pointed forwards. So when the tank moved at full speed, the exhaust would blow back into the cab, blinding and choking the crew. Uh, in spite of this, the Whippet has something of a fan base, so I couldn't not mention it. There was also the Liberty. Officially labelled the Tank Mark 7, when America entered the war, Britain floated the idea to the US Congress of developing their latest tank prototype, that was the Mark 6, which was what the Mark 5 was originally supposed to be, in America instead of Britain or France, allowing it to divert its resources to shipbuilding. Congress was interested in the idea, but what they were not interested in was British designs. They wanted their own American design, but they had absolutely no idea what a tank was, so they proposed a joint design program in which they proposed that Britain would design a tank, and then they would claim that they designed it. That tank was the Mark VI, later known as the International, and then the Liberty. Its history is a pebble dash of problems as the two sides try to come to an agreement, but... And then, finally, Australia. They did a tank. Well, I mean, they didn't build one, but Lancelot de Mole wrote a very strong design for a tank that was vastly superior to anything the British had been thinking of at the time. But he was Australian, so the Brits never took him seriously. Though in 1919 he was awarded 987 Great British Pounds as a show of thanks for trying. Adjusted for inflation, that's about £51,000, which is not bad. I mean, a man could buy a lot of turnips for that. And, 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 and you could just replant those turnips. And turnips make more turnips, and before you know it, infinite turnips! Anyway, I'm going into a tunnel now. No, wait, it's a bar. I lied. It's tequila time for Laser Pig. Goodbye. It's raining, man. Hallelujah, it's raining, man. Hey, man. I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna let myself get absolutely soaking wet. It's raining, man. Hallelujah, it's raining, man. by the way.